Hello everyone, how are you? I'm Ari Ferger and today I'm going to talk about... <laughs> Hello everyone, how are you? I'm Ari Ferger and today I'm going to talk about... <laughs> Hello friends, how are you? I'm Mari Ferger and today I'm going to talk about runic curse. <laughs> Toss a coin to your witcher, O oh, Valley of Plenty, O oh, Valley of Plenty, ho oh, oh, oh. Do you mind? <coughs> Mr. Thorstein, my friend, my dear friend, I'm trying to make a video. Oh, I didn't see you there. <laughs> No, thank you. <laughs> but please, just give me a moment to, to make this video. Oh, right, right. Hello, friends. How are you? I'm Ari Theriger, and today I'm going to talk about runic curses and Needstang, the kneading pole. There, I said it, finally. <laughs> now, this was a video suggested by one of my patrons, um, his Nikki Wade, notoriously known as Zephy Evernight. Thank you for the suggestion, madam. Thank you very much. You know, my patrons, I love my patrons. I love all of them, but they are into very, very weird stuff. And I'm afraid they came to the right place. So I do hope all of you enjoy this video. Let's get started. <laughs> all right, I think we should start with rune curses or runes of power that might cause some mischief. So. As you well know, the name Rune, Runa or Runor means secret and also denotes mystery. You will often find that the term comes from a Germanic root, which I have my doubts because before any vestiges of a clear structured Germanic language, the same phonetics of this term were already being used in Western Europe, in the Atlantic, among Gaelic peoples and also among the Lusitanians. In fact, one of the goddesses of the Lusitanians from northern Portugal was called Trebaruna or Trebaruno and she comes from an older tradition even before Indo-Europeans, before Lusitanians of course, a goddess of secrets and mystery and her name in fact means home of secrets and for almost a century it was thought that she was a goddess of the home but most likely it indicates that she was a goddess of a specific temple of mysteries, of magical arts, most likely related to divination and the use of runes. Since the oldest runic alphabet we know of comes exactly from this part of the world of Europe, where it's nowadays Portugal. Anyway, doesn't matter now. <laughs> what matters is to understand that the term rune means secret and mystery. Mysteries contained within the symbols themselves and to which specific people dedicated their time, dedicated their life to the study of these mysteries in order to reveal their secrets. So, there has always been a lot of superstition around the runes mostly caused by the fear of their misuse. Because if the one using the runes was not knowledgeable about their secrets, the outcome could be disastrous, quite dangerous. And as such, when the runes finally became alphabets, symbols that denote specific letters of a specific language, many messages were written and warnings, all sorts of things, including curses, were written in runes. Not only because of the belief that the runes themselves contain power, but by writing intention with the runes, the intention itself would, would be infused by the power of the runes being used to describe the intention. And so, the more reason to fear the warnings and curses, uh, which I will show a few examples further ahead, don't worry. Runes have been used for over a millennia. In fact, <laughs> as previously said, the oldest runic alphabet we know of dates at least to 6,000 years ago. Um, in fact, it's not just the oldest runic alphabet, but the oldest alphabet in the world. And before being an alphabet, the symbols already existed as well, but did not denote letters, obviously but were symbols representative of a variety of ideas, 
that expressed all sorts of natural, human and cosmic phenomena. Yes, I'm still talking about the runes of nowadays Northern Portugal, from the late Stone Age, but I'll have a video for you in the near future about that subject. Don't worry, <laughs> there is so much I want to tell you and I'm already getting ahead of myself, but already preparing you for what's to come. Ooh, the mystery. <laughs> now, the oldest ritualistic performances using the runes that we know of, of course, was the casting of pieces of wood, lots, twigs, with runic inscriptions carved on them to predict the future or to obtain an answer from the oracle that was casting the runes. Now, concerning runic curses or warnings or a clear magical purpose inscribed with runes, it's very, very hard to find because we have a little bit of a problem here. Runes have been used as symbols before they became alphabets. And the use of symbols alone tells us nothing or close to nothing of what we are facing there when we find such symbols out of any linguistic context. Runes in the Germanic world, especially in Scandinavia, that clearly demonstrate a message, letters of an alphabet, are quite late in the history of runes. Runes in Scandinavia became alphabets, um, became symbols that denote letters and therefore it is a clear writing expressed in there. That was a very recent phenomenon, most of which are from the Middle Ages, in a time when runic magic was not completely forgotten yet, but people were already using the runes for a variety of other purposes, uh, to write a variety of things and mostly carving them on stone to make a monument, a memorial stone to the dead that tells in short to whom the memorial stone is being dedicated to, sometimes with specific art artistic styles and sometimes the more richly carved have also uh, a variety of mythological accounts, figures carved alongside runic text. So, runic curses, in a time when we can clearly read the curse or warning, were already too few. And mind that I'm talking about curses, which is a tiny, tiny fraction of runic magic as a whole. Because a variety of runes being used for all sorts of magical purposes can still be found. And we also have mentions of them. For instance, in Egil's saga, the skald Egil uses runes to cure a young girl who has been cursed by runes. Egil carves new runes, places them under the, the girl's pillow, and as a result, the girl is healed. So we have the mention of rune magic being used to heal or as a counter effect to runic curses. We also have the peculiar example of a runic staff or type of runic wand that was waved at a person. Its user wished to catch someone <laughs> in relation to having a bride or a husband. So the runic wand was waved at the person whom they wished to catch. This was a tradition in the Middle Ages, at least according to the medieval ballads we are able to study. It was possible <laughs> to seduce a woman using runes. For instance, um, in the Danish ballad, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the knight Stig was in love with Christian. Uh, Stig tries to win her affections with the aid of a staff with runic inscriptions, which he waves under her skirt. <laughs> but unfortunately, the staff accidentally rolls under the, the princess dress, another woman, and the magic works upon her instead. The princess falls in love with Stig straight away, and he has to marry her. This might be a medieval satire, obviously with sexual connotations, but nonetheless, it's interesting, the, the use of runes in here. But let's take a look at some very interesting rune stones. The first example I want to show you is from Denmark, the Glevenhoop rune stone. Um, this particular rune stone displays a warning to anyone who dares to damage or move the stone and the runic inscription reads thus and I quote Ragnhildr placed this stone in memory of 
Ali, the Pale, Priest of the Sanctuary, Honorable Tang of the Retinue. Ali's sons made this monument in memory of their father and his wife in memory of her husband. <laughs> and Sothi carved these runes in memory of his lord. Thor, hallow these runes. A warlock be he who damages this stone or drags it to stand in memory of another. So, this is particularly interesting. Um, we have a memorial stone dedicated to Ali, a priest of the local sanctuary, and also a thane, a man who held land granted by the king or by a military nobleman. So a person of some status. The person, a, a person named Sothi carved the runes and the runes were hallowed by the god Thor himself, invoking the deity as the divine power to consecrate the runes and give them potency. And then the last part reads, and I quote again, a warlock be he who damages this stone or drags it to stand in memory of another. So this last sentence puts a curse upon anyone who damages the stone or places it as a monument to another person. The warning is not the curse. The curse is implicit. It's, it's implied by the runes that were used to write the warning, to write the intention. So this is an example of a curse and the person becomes a warlock. <laughs> I'll put a note down here in relation to the concept of the warlock. Well, in the Middle Ages, uh, the term warlock became an insult, a grave insult. But it wasn't always like that, obviously. So this idea of a warlock being something bad, uh, we are already in the presence of a certain Christian mentality, or rather intolerance upon certain practitioners of a specific magic. Now, the runestone in question dates from the late 10th century, and Christianity was already known in Denmark at least since the 6th century. So, naturally, some aspects in the, um, in, of, of the Christian mentality towards pagan magic in general was already being adopted. Anyway, uh, um, I, I particularly enjoy the part of invoking Thor to hallow the runes, or perhaps not invoking, but evoking, which is quite different in this context. Uh, and I'm quite certain you know the differences, especially in terms of magical work and sorcery. Anyway, <laughs> I've shown you uh, an example, if I'm not mistaken, in the video about talismans in Norse magic and witchcraft. I believe it was the, the very last example I've given in that video. Uh, a talismanic object from the Viking Age, a copper plate found in Vinsvi in Oland in Sweden, which dates from the late 11th century. It's composed by 144 staves. It contains at least six magical bind rune staves. Unfortunately, the first one was lost due to the action of time and the elements. But the text in runes reads thus, and I quote, Glory to thee, I bear, Buffy. Help me. Who is wiser than thou? And bear, bear all in evil from Buffy. May Thor protect him with that hammer that, uh, that from the sea came. It flew from evil. Wit fares not from Buffy. The gods are under him and over him. <laughs> this talisman calls for the protective power of Thor and his hammer, Mjolnir. But this is an apotropaic object to a specific person. Nonetheless, it's very curious that in many cases it's Thor that is called upon to hallow the runes and not Odin or any other god. <laughs> now, we have other examples such as the Björketor runestone from Sweden, uh, located in Viki which is one of the tallest runestones in the world, by the way. <laughs> this one right, re right here, this monster. <laughs> the runes were carved somewhere between the 6th and the 7th century in Proto-Norse language, not yet Old Norse. This is the language that became the, the basis of Old Norse language. Now, 
The stone contains two inscriptions, one on each side of the stone. The shorter line of the runes was transcribed and translated into I foresee perdition, which is not at all a good omen. <laughs> However, the, uh, the, the message on the other side of the runestone says, and I quote, <laughs> I, master of the runes, conceal here runes of power. Incessantly plagued by maleficence, doom, doom to insidious death, is he who breaks this monument. I prophesy destruction or prophecy of destruction. Now, this rune stone um, doesn't contain names, but it seems to be part of the funerary complex around it. There are men here nearby, standing stones, all around, which are part of a burial field. So this specific rune stone might be a reference to the entire complex. And the warning is to not destroy or break this complex of stones in the burial field, or a curse falls upon the person who does it not only on the person who will be plagued by maleficence and doomed to an insidious death, but a prophecy of destruction is also included in the package. And most likely, it is referring to the release of something really, really bad that might fall upon the, the entire community if the stone is removed or broken. So not only the person who might do that will be cursed to have a horrible death, but the curse is most likely unleashed and spreads all over the entire community. A prophecy of destruction. Better just leave it be. <laughs> In the same area, we have the Stentofen runestone. And this particular runestone, this little monstrous baby, <laughs> is indeed related to the previous one. It contains an inscription related to the previous runestone with a curse in the Proto-Norse language as well. And I quote, To the dwellers and guests, Alpha Ulfar gave full here, Hari Ulfar, something, I, master of the runes, conceal here nine bucks, nine stallions, Alpha Ulfar gave fruitful here, Ari Ulfar, something, I, master of the runes, conceal here runes of power. Incessantly plagued by Maleficence, doomed to insidious death, is he who this breaks. <laughs> Not only we, we have a similar warning that unleashes a curse upon the individual that causes any harm, um, any harm <laughs> to the runestone, but also the inscription describes animal sacrifice as a part of a ritual related to fertility. Or so it seems. There is also the, the peculiar, interesting case of the Selvi runestone, also from Sweden, <laughs> and the inscription reads, and I quote, Freystein made these monuments in memory of Thora, his wife. <laughs> she was something, daughter, the best of her generation. May he who cuts to pieces, breaks, become a warlock and a maleficent woman. A man named Freystein made this in memory of his wife, Thora. Again, the inscription is a warning to all of those who might want to destroy this special place created in the memory of the wife of this man. Now, what more can we say about rune curses? Let's see. There are several modern day runic curses, runic formulas to curse someone, to send a particular curse or to enhance an already existing curse. I have studied quite a few and in most cases I find it absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> the runes have the power to create and have the power to destroy, but more often than not, it's all about a childish fancy and playing at being sorcerers. There is a surprisingly great number of crap about runic curses out there. Anyway, this doesn't mean it's not possible to curse someone with runes. Not going to teach you that, of course, because I will not be held responsible for somebody else's misfortune. 
Each person does it as they please, but keep it to yourself, as I too keep it to myself. Now, this is why I gave you the previous examples, the rune stones. Those are good historical and reliable examples of runic curses. They never come out as a direct curse. They come out as a warning. And it's implicit in there, a curse, if the person ignores the warning. So do remember that. When you find modern day runic curses directly cursing the person and clearly showing intention, it is the same old story of playing with what they don't know. Our Nordic European ancestors were smarter than that. <laughs> The misfortune of others was not in their hands, because they made the warning. The curse was there, and the curse would only be unleashed if a person ignored the warning. So the one who got the curse, it was that person's own fault for refusing to take notice of or to acknowledge or disregard intentionally, intentionally <laughs> the warning. You see, the creation of curses in Northern Europe had its sort of laws in hidden times. It obeyed to a specific canon. You do not curse directly. You set out a warning and the curse is in it. If someone disregards the warning, it's on their head. It's the same thing as putting a warning on an electric fence. Don't touch it, big letters. It's an electric fence. The one who, put, who, who placed the electric fence there is working within the law. The person placed the warning. You only get electrocuted if you disregard the warning and intentionally put your hand there without anyone forcing you to. This is how it works. When you see runic curses with specific intention of curse or hex directly, that's something quite modern. And when I mean modern, I mean 14th century and late 15th century onwards. The consolidation of Western traditional magic with Eastern magical practices. We start to see this in Icelandic magical states, for instance, and very few cases use actual runes. You no longer have runic inscriptions, but sigils, the combination of symbols from various traditions, mostly from Eastern sorcery, in great part actually from the Middle East. And of course, nowadays you have a wondrous variety of runic curses that use, for instance, African traditions related to voodoo and fetishism. It's fun. It's a mess of ideas and traditions. It's called trying and failing until we succeed, but it's a bloody mess. And at some point, you cease to actually draw the power of the runes and completely disregard their potency. Nowadays, at some point, runic magic becomes everything except actual runic magic. Let me just give you a quick advice for no good reason. Uh, you might take it or not. It's good and useful to know a little bit of everything. But if you do not specialize in something, you will never be good at something. <laughs> It's good, certainly, to have knowledge about a variety of things, but you will only know pieces of each specific field and never fully know and understand one specific field and therefore be actually good at it. In terms of magical work, it's the same thing. Nothing will ever work if you are not good at a specific field of expertise, so to speak. Knowing bits of this and that is knowing nothing at all, because there won't be results. Choose and delve into a subject. Learn everything there is to know about it, and even more, <laughs> and cross the limits. Now, before we move on to the Needstank case, I want to speak a little bit about Icelandic magical staves and curses, as well as other points, so you may understand why and when we get an awful lot of magical curses in the Scandinavian culture. Let's see. Icelandic magical staves, as you know, have little, close to nothing, in relation to runic symbols. Such symbols, the, the sigils, were not produced during the heathen period. 
pagan times. They are the product of late medieval and modern periods. Icelandic magical staves are the product of the consolidation of the Western traditional magical arts, which happened during the Renaissance period, with Eastern magical arts. We can sort of divide Icelandic magical staves into several categories according to the purposes they have been created for, which are apotropaic magic, farming, fishing and trading, friendship, favor and influence, crime and disputes, healing, love and seduction, divination, games and sports, luck and wishes, and finally, spells for malign intent. As you can see, the great majority of Icelandic magical staves are not to curse another person, and in general, there are more Icelandic magical staves for beneficial purposes than non-beneficial. But let's focus on the ones for malign intent. Without counting with certain magical staves in the category of love and seduction, which could very well pass through curses, terrible curses. Of all the surviving magical staves we know of, or that have survived to this day, there are 57 spells with the purpose of cause harm or curse another, or, or to cause some sort of misery and even death, malign intent. In, in these 57 cases, most are to cause fear to an enemy or to harm livestock or to fall into a deep sleep and from which never wake up again and to make someone lose their way, often related to storms, blizzards and or in a fog. Other examples is to make someone become a thief so they can be caught and jailed or sentenced to, to death for their crime or to cause uncontrollable farting, yes, <laughs> or to prevent someone from fishing, therefore they have a great blow in their economy and also sustenance, such is the case of magical staves to cause harm to cattle as well. And we have cases to cause death by falling off a horse. These are the sort of curses in Icelandic magical staves. And the very, the, the very worst of them, the spoken incantations in them, expressed, are actually drawn straight from the Bible. <laughs> what we can conclude from this is that there were never a great amount of curses in Scandinavian magical arts to begin with. And we start to see some increase in the curses precisely after Christianity with Protestantism, and most of which are curses drawn straight from the Bible. This is the psychology of religion. We start to see the increase of spells with malign intent as a widespread response to the fear of evil magic. And so this fear justifies the means. In here we enter in a different religious panorama of intolerance against practitioners of magic. With Protestantism begins the great witch trials, or there, there is a great increase, and many stories concocted around the fear of witches in league with the devil. Due to Protestantism, a general panic towards witchcraft is installed, and so most people start to create curses, spells with malign intent as a response to the spells sent by the worshippers of the devil, witches, magicians, sorcerers and warlocks. <laughs> a defensive mechanism, because people in general felt like victims, a fear constructed by the religious intolerance of Protestantism, which led people to create curses to protect themselves against the evil doings of witches. People lived in fear of the stories created by the religious authority of that time. This is one of the reasons why we don't find many magical curses in heathen times, pagan times, especially not with the use of runes, because most magical arts in pagan times were for beneficial purposes and hardly with harmful intention. 
when people started to fear those who kept the old traditions, they started to create curses of their own to protect themselves and counterattack any harmful spell from witches and warlocks and whatnot. The great majority of Scandinavian curses and in magical arts actually appear after the introduction of Christianity. And not, not with Catholicism, but with Protestantism. So don't expect to find many runic curses. The only rune curses that existed are the examples I have shown you previously. The ones about the, the rune stones. Those are the typical curses of heathen times, pagan times, working as warnings. This is very important to understand. Like I said, it's the psychology of religion. It was mainly fear caused by religion that created awful curses. Christianity is a religion of fear. And this is a, a perfect example. With Protestantism, it was even worse. A religion of fear, intolerance and hatred, which had this awful psychological effect on people and made them create the worst, the worst the worst types of curses. Furthermore, it's precisely with Protestantism and during and after the witch trials, in Sweden at least, that we start to see the so-called uh, foriora, <laughs> destructive spells, spells to get revenge, to hurt, torment and even kill. Basically curses to destroy the victim. Most of these curses are actually from the 19th century, a century of special religious intolerance in the north, especially against indigenous peoples, such as the Sami. Not just in Sweden and Norway, but also in Denmark. And these curses, in their incantations, expression, contain Amen, for instance. I'll put an, an example somewhere in here, one from Sweden, which is quite elaborate, and you will see the great amount of Christian references in it. So, in conclusion, the great majority of curses in magical arts in Scandinavia were either introduced or produced with or by Christianity. This is how much hate this religion contains. A religion that professes to love your neighbor, and they speak quite a lot about love, but just empty words. Nowadays, things might be changing a little, of course, but most of these curses, foriora, destructive spells, are from the 19th and 20th century, which wasn't that long ago. But there is one specific hidden curse that is quite terrible and lasted for many centuries, and in the 20th century was still being used, at least in Iceland. Yes, you know what I am talking about. Let's move on to the Nidstang. Nidstang is by far the best sort of runic curse to survive to our days. Nidstang, Kneading Pole, the Rision Pole. A stang in Old Norse is a staff, a pole or a standard pole. And need might, might be two things. As you know, need was used as an insult, mostly to express the lack of honor. So the Nidstang is a the Rision Pole with the intent to taunt, to make mockery, to express denigration towards someone. It is a symbol to express that towards another person with the intent to offend the other person and indirectly, through this symbology, to cause defamation and if that person has any honor left, the person will not take this insult and will react. Nidstang was a way to provoke reaction. It is a scorn pull. However, it might also derive from needy, the dark one, <laughs> derived from need as well, uh, which is darkness or dark. Need was used to describe the new moon, total darkness in the sky. So the needing pole, needs tongue, is also related to a sense of darkness. So we have the conjugation of these two aspects, defamation and darkness or dark. But darkness in here isn't related to dark magic, chaotic and shadow work or the left-hand path. 
darkness in here is related to the dark depths of the underworld, the underground. To call upon the Tonic powers, the powers concerning or belonging to the underworld. As I've said plenty of times, <laughs> in the pagan past, the realm of the underworld wasn't seen as an infernal-like place, as in the Christian sense, and not seen as a place somewhere in some other reality. <laughs> the underworld was perceived to be the earth beneath our feet, literally down there, where the ancestors and underworld deities live. The only infernal connotation is in the sense of being inferior in relation to the opposite reality, the, the upper world, supernal, superior. Supernal and infernal not in the sense of being with high quality and lower quality or high, higher in rank or, or status and lower in rank or status, but in the physical sense, literally. One is up and one is down. The Nidstang is a pole placed in the earth, stabbing the earth for practical purposes, of course, so that the, the pole is standing. However, in many ancient pagan cultures, and this is particularly noticeable among the Romans, every time there was the need to open a hole or dig the earth for some purpose, even in agriculture, the religious belief was that people were opening the underworld and the underworld deities and spirits would have contact with the upper world, were being exposed. As such, most activities that dealt with the opening of the earth, exposing the underworld, were activities highly ritualized. Take the example of the Roman agrimensor, or grammatici, which were the people who projected the parceling of the territory. This parceling of the territory was quite physical, done with a plow, revolving the soils and exposing the underworld. The first ritualistic act was with the supervision of a religious member, a priest. The underworld gods were being exposed after all. And the first ritualistic act was opening a line that would be made with the plow, exposing the underworld. And this line was called Valum, which was the line made by the plow to delimit the limit between the city or the civilized world from the uncivilized, the profane, to make a division between the pars destra, the right side, and the pars sinistra, the left side. The profane, where agriculture and the necropolis and other aspects of the Roman life that dealt with the uncivilized and the, the underworld, the profane and the wilds were kept. So, to the Germanic peoples, anything involving being in contact with the ground was also perceived to also being in contact with the underworld, the realm of the dead, the underworld deities right there beneath our feet. And so, to the Scandinavians, the Nidstank was literally placing the pole on the ground, thus disturbing the ground. Those who lived in the underworld, a dark place, hence Nid also meant dark or darkness. In magical terms, need, the, the Nidding pole was precisely uh, intended to disrupt and anger the earth spirits, the earth spiritual entities, land Vaithir, land whites, and the Ofar, elves, ancestral spirits, inhabiting the ground where the pole was being placed, and the Nidstang was often placed in the property or near the house of the person it was meant to provoke, to drive out the spirits of the, the, the area, the land, and therefore the land becomes infertile. The spirits were angry, and would conduct their anger towards the person the needing pole was being directed to. And that person's livelihood and life in general would be destroyed by the angry spirits. The needing poles were also used to desecrate areas of ground. And in the sources we actually have a name for this technique, this purpose, which was called Ulfrica, literally 
the driving away of the elves, the earth spirits of the place would be banished, leaving the ground spiritually dead, therefore impossible to farm on it and make anything grow, and even cattle would have nothing to eat from it and would surely die out. We have a good example of the use of this curse in Old Norse literature. I've spoken before about the Needing Pole event in Egil's saga. Egil, Skala Grimson, went up into a high place overlooking the sea and the land below. He took a hazel pole, placed a horse's head and fixed it on the pole. And after that, he verbally cursed King Eric Bloodaxe and his wife Gunhild. Not just verbally, but Egil also carved the runes on the pole, expressing the whole form of the curse. He turned the horse's head towards King Herrick and Queen Gunhild and sent them the curse. And this is important. He also turns the curse on the guardian spirits who dwell in this land, that they may, may all wander astray and never reach or find their home until they have driven out of the land King Eric and, and Queen Gunhild. And so after saying the curse and carving the runes, he placed the pole in that place <laughs> and it was meant to be there until the spirits of the land took action and drove out King Eric and Queen Gunhild. And sure enough, the curse took effect and they fled to the British Isles. In Vetensdila Saga, there is a passage um, recording a duel between Finnbogi and Jokul. When Finnbogi failed to show up for the Holmganga, a duel, Jokul raised a kneading pole against Finnbogi for his cowardice, and he carves magic runes on the pole. He then kills a mare and then places the pole into the mare's breast with the head facing towards Fingbogi's dwelling place, taunting Fingbogi and cursing him at the same time to provoke action for the two main reasons expressed before, due to directly expressing defamation, so it was a hard blow on personal honor, and because the pole was meant to literally kill the land, spiritually kill the land, by driving away the spirits of the land, and so Fingbogi would have to take action unless he wants to lose his livelihood and also honor. I find it curious, the use of the horse's head. Why was that for? Why specifically the horse's head? I've done a video about the horse in Norse religion or something like that. <laughs> it was indeed by far the most sacrificed animal. It was an important animal. It was a status symbol, and only the most important animals would be sacrificed in order to give them as offerings to the gods. What was extremely important to a, a pagan culture was precisely what would be given to the gods. In some of the holiest rites, a horse was sacrificed and eaten, and the head or skull of the horse could be used for a variety of things, or wording spells to ward off evil, or to mark a warning. The horse was usually characterized as the mount that led people into the underworld, and gods visiting the underworld would go on horseback, such as Hermodr. Gods related to death would also ride a horse, such as Odin. The horse was also the animal representative of fertility, deities, such as Freyr, deities related to the soils, the underground, the underworld. The horse was also an animal of the giants, the beings whose worship existed and were related to the earth, the worship of the earth. Thor kills Rungnir, the giant, and gives Rungnir's horse to his son Magni, and the horse was called Gulfaxi. Rimdhurs, the disguised giant, who offered to build the walls of Valhalla in, in a few months to protect the Aesir from cliff giants, using his horse Svalifari to draw huge rocks so he could build the walls. 
The same horse, Loki, seduced disguised as a mare and bore the hate-legged horse, Sleifnir. And so on and so forth. <laughs> the horse was indeed a powerful animal in the religious and spiritual panorama of pre-Christian Northern Europe. And not only was the most sacrificed animal, but also the animal referred to more often in the literary sources. The horse was an emblem of wealth and status among Scandinavians, and became associated with prestigious deities. As you know, horse sacrifices were an important part of Indo-European traditions and survived into the medieval period. You will often find references saying that the Nidstang, the kneading pole, is related to the rune Hewas, for obvious reasons, because it literally means horse. Although I don't share that opinion. It's just too obvious. I believe Nidstang is actually related to the rune Thurisas. The rune that means Thurses, Thursar, giants. It's a rune that expresses chaos and destructive forces, a rune of empowerment. It's a rune not only related to giants, and as we have seen, the horse is related to both giants and deities related to the earth, the underworld, but it's also the rune of Thor, the god of thunder, and his condition as a thunder god reflects precisely the expression of ultimate chaos from nature. Besides, Thor is also a fertility god related to the soils. So it's the best rune that represents Gnonic powers, the powers of the earth and the underworld. As we have seen, the Nidstang is related to the powers of the underworld, the powers of the earth, and to drive out the spirits of the land precisely by arousing their anger and therefore provoking a manifestation of their powers, their chaotic powers. Before the runes became expressions of letters, they were symbols that represented a variety of things such as human and animal and cosmic phenomena, as well as from nature, and also expressed powerful symbols of the spiritual and the religious realities. Thurizas is the stylized representation of a farming tool with which, or it was turned into a weapon. It started off as a tool to cut weeds and dig the floor, which evolved into something more sophisticated. In English you called it an adze, but I, I don't think that is the best term to describe this tool. Anyway, it was a tool to revolve the soils dig the soils, and this was the tool that gave rise to the axe, to cut down the trees, to create farming fields. Not only a tool, but it became a weapon. As I said before, Thur's weapon was an axe before it became a hammer. Also, the runes are not exclusively a Germanic phenomenon. So this particular rune, that would later be called Thurizas, is the representation of both the farming tool and the weapon, closely associated with gods of fertility and of the earth, the underworld, the soils. These were the giants, the earth gods of the indigenous peoples before the Indo-Europeans. Thurizas is the rune of giants, and it represents the tool and weapon representative of their realm the tool with which the soils were exposed, the archaic tool that not only would evolve into the axe, but also into the plow, when this tool was elongated and adapted to, the, to be pulled by animals instead of solely human strength applied to the action of opening up the fields, revealing the underworld. When the Nidstang was placed on the earth, was to call upon the underworld powers, the powers of the earth, opening up the soils, disturbing them and arousing the spirits of the land, their chaotic powers. The pole channeled the destructive and chaotic forces of the earth deities and spirits. These forces were carried up the pole and projected through the horse's skull, through its eyes. 
The Thurisa's rune is the exact same thing. It is the rune to call upon primordial powers, chaotic forces of nature. The giants, which were the old gods before Indo-Europeans. Gods of the earth. And also the powers of the underworld gods. The rune Thurisa's invokes the power of the Thurs, the Thursar, the primordial gods, primordial giants. The representation of the chaotic forces of the natural world, coming from below, coming from the earth. And a very good example in Old Norse literature of this comes from the poem Skirnismal, where the spell used by Skirnir against the giant Gerdr, which was to be Freyr's wife, that same spell slash curse invokes harm using the Thurisa's rune. So the Nidstang a pole and the horse's skull represents the Thurisa's rune. It had the same format, a pole and a triangle representing the horse's head. Thurisa's is the stylized representation of the farming tools and weapons I have shown you previously. And conveniently, the needs tongue is to make the physical representation of the Thurisa's rune, expressing the Thurisa's rune and its power, invoking its power by representing it with a pole and the head of a sacrificed animal. The pole going through the head of the animal. Before this video comes to an end, I think it would be interesting to tell you that the Nidstang survived until our days, mostly disguised in a variety of traditions, one of which is the hobby horse. <laughs> the hobby horse is a children's game. The horse-headed stick that children put between <laughs> their legs for make-believe riding. This apparently innocent toy was named after Hob, or Hobbin, or Hold Hob, a variant of Robin, and another name for the devil in colloquial English. To ride the hobby horse was to raise Hob, or raise the devil, symbolizing the ancient pagan shaman who rode the horse of the other world into the other world as a sign of mystic enlightenment. It also survived in the, in the tradition of uh, Mary Lud, the Grey Mare, uh, and part of the New Year house visiting and luck bringing rituals in southeast Wales, or the Cornish Penglas and a variety of other traditions. But mostly, the pole with a horse head children ride is not that innocent after all. It's an interesting way to keep a tradition and turning it into something more innocent. <laughs> Alright my dear friends, I hope you have enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. And as always, bye for real. <laughs>